The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I am uh, pleased to rise today to speak uh, uh, and use a bit of this uh, allotted time to talk about an aspect of the 2020-21 budget that is sorely lacking, both in dollar amounts and in vision. In my community of Dartmouth North and in many other parts of the province, there is a housing crisis. This is something that I have mentioned many times, my colleagues have mentioned many times, and even other members in this House have mentioned many times in this House. But unfortunately, uh, this issue bears repeating. I wanted to remind, uh, use some of this time right now to remind uh, the House uh, about some of what's happening in Dartmouth North. And I dare say that uh, we may be uh, in Dartmouth North uh, uh, a canary in a coal mine, as it were. Our community is, in a way, a canary in a coal mine when it comes to this crisis. Uh, I've been talking about it for many months, and it seems to be spreading now. So, um, to remind you, in August, since August, I should say, the number one reason that folks have, uh, have been coming to my office, my very busy office, I will say, uh, for help, is because they are facing eviction, or they're living in unsafe or unstable situations, they can't find anywhere to move to, and they have been told, or they've been told that their rent will be getting raised by an amount they simply cannot pay. And therefore, they'll have to move or face eviction when they start getting behind on their rent. And of course, that when someone faces eviction or, or is evicted because of rental arrears, that puts a, a, a mark on their record, and it's extremely difficult to, to find any other place to live. The other reason uh, that people are coming in to my office is to get access to the heating rebate program applications, and that points to, to a, a very high level of energy poverty in my area, which is another thing that this budget, budget doesn't do a whole lot to help, but maybe we'll talk about that later in estimates. So why are people getting evicted? Rising rents, uncontrolled raises in rents, uncontrolled rent increases. They're also uh, being evicted because of renovations, mass evictions because of renovations. Currently in Dartmouth North that I know of, there is one building in which all the tenants are being told uh, that they must leave. Many of them have already gone uh, in order that the building can be totally uh, renovated. And then, um, of course, they will be the first to know when they can apply for new units. So they haven't even been given a first right of refusal for the renovated units, but they will be told first First, when they can start applying, but Mr. Speaker, the rents will be raised at least $200 from what the people are paying now. So when you are on a fixed income uh, and making very little money, if you are a senior on uh, CPP or you're um, uh, on income assistance, a $200 uh, rent increase is impossible. So that's one building that I know of. And then there are at least three others that I know of that, are, that the tenants have been told by landlords, new landlords, I might add, that this exact thing is coming down the pike in two or three weeks once they get their permits in place and everyone will be out. That's how they've been told. So um, that's happening. The other reason people are getting evicted, weird, strange, and unlikely region, reasons. So um, this was not really happening. We didn't see this happening before this, uh, the, the low vacancy rate in HRM. But I had a, a person come in my office one day who um, had been a model tenant for 11 years and then all of a sudden was told she was being loud and abusive. I don't think that happens out of the blue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and there are many other examples like that. People getting evicted for strange reasons. Um, so what happens when someone gets evicted? Well, first thing is they basically are homeless because there's nowhere else to move to. They can't find a new place to live. Dartmouth North has always been a place where you can get a cheap apartment. That's not the case anymore, Mr. Speaker. Dartmouth Housing Help, which is the best place to go, the place that we navigate people to, uh, to help people uh, who are looking for, um, for uh, uh, affordable rentals, uh, they're no longer accepting new clients. 
in a release last week, they said that, the, that Dartmouth North is now saturated and they're unable to help, uh, and that means saturated in terms of uh, no vacancies, uh, and they're not able to help until something shifts, until they can, they can help the people that they're already uh, involved with. They will, just for the record, uh, still have some drop-in hours where people can get help filling out forms for housing and rent, uh, rent supplements, but that's all they're able to do for new clients. So, what happens when people get evicted? Uh, many are going to shelters, but the shelters fill up very quickly. So when someone comes to me and says, I've been evicted, we call the shelters, shelters are full. If they're connected with DCS, we give them a call. Sometimes they get put in a hotel. Well, we all know, uh, based on news stories for the last several weeks, what's, what's, what's um, that situation? It's not, it's not tenable, it's not sustainable. There are families with children living in hotel rooms. It's impossible, Mr. Speaker, it's an impossible situation. So I guess the other option is, well, like what happened to one of my uh, constituents in the summertime, when it was a little bit, a little bit warmer out, into, I guess end of summer, uh, she was told by her worker that, the, that DCS would buy her a tent. So I guess when the weather's a little warmer, you could start a tent city. Uh, you could live in a hotel with your family of young children. You could couch surf. Uh, you could go back to a housing situation which is wholly unsafe for you. There's basically those are the options, Mr. Speaker. So, why can't people find places to live? The vacancy rate is at 1%. This is an all-time low. This is lower than large cities in, in Canada and North America. And in Dartmouth North, uh, or in Dartmouth, the, rate, the vacancy rate is, uh, is thought to be 0.5%. Landlords are very able to be choosy over who they rent to now. People who rely on income assistance or child benefit or who need a rent supplement, which are, uh, the rent supplements, by the way, we all know this government loves to talk about rent supplements. Well, they don't do any good if there's nowhere to live. And they also don't do well, they don't do good when a landlord has 30 people lined up for a unit. Landlords are not going to choose to house people who use rent supplements because they're administratively burdensome. Why would they do it if they can just get a regular old check from someone who can pay the rent? By the way, it is illegal for landlords to discriminate based on source of income, Mr. Speaker, but it doesn't seem to be stopping many of the landlords in HRM and in Nova Scotia right now. The Human Rights Commission has uh, you know, put out uh, uh, information releases about this situation, and um, yet we still see ads on Kijiji, adults only, uh, or, um, or people who are getting um, d basically refused because they are on income assistance or, that they're, or their child benefit, which is like frankly a good source of income uh, and can pay m fairly high rents with child benefit, uh, uh, they're getting refused. So we also know that there's a wait list of thousands for public housing and for rent supplements. So I've already outlined a little bit of what happens when someone can't find a place to live. Uh, tents, shelters, but shelters are always full. Uh, hotels, people are couch surfing or staying with friends or former partners in very or potentially dangerous situations. But Mr. Speaker, one thing that I want to point out right now is that this is not just a problem for poor people. It is a very bad problem for poor people, for people who don't have a lot of money to make ends meet. It is definitely, uh, a, a it is the big issue. Uh, but I also know of a retired teacher in Dartmouth North who lives in a very nice apartment building, but is on a fixed income and is extremely worried about the rates at which his uh, um, rents are raising. I know of someone who has a unionized job that pays a living wage for Halifax, whose awesome apartment that, that was perfect for their, their family, their life, uh, is now in question because the building has been sold and the landlord may change the rental agreement or raise the rents to amount they cannot afford. We know that most people are $200 away from not being able to make ends meet. So what happens when a, when a rent gets increased by 300? Mm -hmm. We are seeing this happening all the time. And so, who cares? So what it, why is this even a problem? Well, it's obvious. Stress and fear about not having a place to live make people sick. 
Living in crappy conditions makes people sick. Living outside makes people sick. For people who have mental health conditions or illnesses, stable housing is the first requirement for getting or staying well, Mr. Speaker. If people are spending all their money on rent, there is nothing else for food, healthy food, or not healthy food for that matter. Uh, there's no money to, 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 to spend on anything that would be a, a, at all uh, resembling you know, a, a, a social life. There's no money to go for coffee with a friend. There's no money to go to a movie. If people are spending all their money on rent, they're not contributing to the local economy. They're not going to restaurants. They're not going to consume an art piece, or they're not going to the theater. They're not going to go see a professional basketball game or the Thunderbirds. They're not going to do any of those things. They're not going to buy new clothes. They can't. I feel like we've talked about this so much in this house that, you know, possibly people are becoming, you know, you know, deadened to this issue. So I'm not really sure how else to paint a picture of how bad this situation actually is. I do know that daily we have families coming into my office, families with young children who are being evicted and don't know where to go. In, in our, this, it, it, it's bad. <laughs> Rent control exists. These are things, oh sorry, I forgot my final heading. What can we do to solve the problem? Uh, rent control. Rent control exists and works in many other jurisdictions in Canada. So to, pardon me? And also here. And also here, it did exist. Oh yeah, you know, I'm getting to that part. I'm getting to that part. <laughs> it's the important part, actually. Uh, but uh, it does exist in, in many other jurisdictions. So when I hear the government say it doesn't work, it's simply not true. It's simply not true. The government already uses rent control for its own contracts and rent supplements. Uh, and also the renovation program. Uh, you know, when the government gives money to, to buildings that are going to be renovated, they, part of the contract to, for that money is that they can only raise rents that are indexed to the CPI. Sounds like a good plan. If it's good enough for the government for its own contracts, it should be good enough for all Nova Scotians. When we ask about this, we get no answers from the government, which is frankly infuriating. We get talking points over and over again that don't actually address the questions, and we get fluff. We also know that co-op and not-for-profit not housing works. We need to see significant investments in those things, not a little bit of money thrown over from this budget. Uh, I'm glad to see the, that the Premier was actually using the words co-ops and not-for-profits. That's an improvement. That's, that's progress. But we need to go a lot further. We also need inclusionary zoning, and we need to strengthen the Residential Tenancies Act so that the landlords are more, more accountable to tenants and are penalized for intimidation. Rent supplements are fine in certain situations if you're okay with the government spending public money to prop up for private, private for-profit investment REITs. But the solution offered in this budget of 560 new rent supplements will not work in the environment we are currently in. There is nowhere to use them, Mr. Speaker. And I am at personally not fine with the government using public money to prop up private for-profit investment REITs, by the way. The housing units announced in this budget are fine too. Great, 39 houses, that's awesome, but not nearly enough. Also, I, I have to say I'll believe it when I see it, Mr. Speaker, because this government has announced for the last two budgets, funding for small options homes, or actually three budgets, since I was elected, they've announced funding every year, and so far we've seen four open and four more being built at some point and will open soon. Mr. Speaker, people are suffering. This, uh, the, the poorest people are suffering, seniors on fixed incomes are suffering, middle income people are suffering. And there are solutions at our fingertips, not one solution, not one great solution, but many that work together. The government needs to show leadership on this issue and admit that there are solutions that it is ignoring or refusing to even take a look at. The government owes it to Nova Scotia to tell us why it refuses uh, to, to collaborate in this way, and it needs to address this issue before it gets any worse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.